William Kendall is our next speaker. Uh, he has the kind of background that's, that makes us all feel like serial underachievers. Well, certainly me anyway. His educational achievements include a law degree from Cambridge and an MBA from INSEAD. His early career included a stint in the army, time as a barrister and an investment banker, before he discovered the joys of entrepreneurship running the new Covent Garden soup company. He then took an embryonic brand called Green and Blacks and led the organization through massive growth to a highly successful sale to Cadbury's. He now splits his time between advising governments and businesses on a variety of topics. He's an active and passionate environmentalist and a firm believer in the positive impact that organizations can have on both society and the environment. I am delighted to welcome the exceptionally erudite William Kendall. Thank you very much. Gosh, flattery indeed. Um, you'll be pleased to know, or maybe not pleased to know, that, uh, that I have no uh, paraphernalia, I've got no motorised skateboards, I've got no fire. I'm not, there's no, there's 15 minutes of me talking, um, which, you know, I'm sorry, no slides even. In fact, I was, I was asked and whether I wanted a white slide or a black slide, and I even delegated responsibility of that to the gentleman at the back, and I, they come up with a white slide, so, uh, you know, I think it was a good call. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to talk to you, I want to really ask you, what, 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 is, what is innovation and creativity? Because we talk about it a lot, we've been talking about it a lot today, and I think there's quite a lot of uncertainty about it. Uh, and then I want to say, why is there so little of it in most organisations? And then challenge you to do something about it, as you have been challenged already by my previous speakers. So what is innovation? Um, I'm often called an entrepreneur. And you know, I don't think it is about brilliant ideas. I'm going to dif differ with Simon here. Um, I think it's about taking everyday ideas and just making them happen. Um, I heard Maurice Saatchi on the radio a couple of weeks ago, um, celebrating, I don't know what it was, the 50th anniversary or some great anniversary of the wonderful organisation. And he was asked about the legacy of Saatchi, and he said it, it, was a, it was actually a few people who dared to believe that they could change the world. And I think that's a lovely idea, but, but uh, you know, that seems rather elitist to me, that only a few people dare to think this. Uh, you know, in so many organisations, I come across innovation teams, and you wonder why innovation is not driven throughout the organisation. Why do you need innovation teams? And, and so often in those organisations, even the innovation teams don't seem to be innovating to me. But the, uh, this is so odd, because the majority of people bring about significant change in their everyday lives. You know, we go home and we change our utility suppliers, we repaint the bathroom, we deal with family crises. We you know, organise huge social events like sort of carnivals or whatever. We make massive capex decisions involving several times our annual revenue, like buying a new house. And we do all this you know, in very, very rationally, and we do it without endless layers of bureaucracy, which so many organisations seem to require before any decision is made, and more, more often than not is not made. So why, why is this? Why don't these same people who are making these monumental decisions, and that's you, by the way, make these things happen in their workplace? And, you know, my, I, 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 I don't have all the answers to this, but I guess it has to be because the leadership teams don't provide the right framework to enable this to happen because, you know, the people are doing it in another framework quite happily. And I fear it's because as organisations grow, the desire to control and avoid the risk of failure takes over from the need to be creative to survive, which is what the organisations I tend to deal with, the entrepreneurial organisations, need. Um, you know, creativity every day is, 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 is vital, is our lifeblood. So it's, if you do nothing about it, as a consequence, the organisation ultimately is overcome by a massive failure. It becomes bureaucratic, cirrhotic, and death follows. That's if you do nothing. So what I say to you today is we have a responsibility to challenge the inevitability of this process. And, you know, I question, do you believe that we can change things in life, or are you one of those people who thinks that your actions are irrelevant? Do you, are you one of those people who switches off the lights, or do you not bother anymore because you know nobody else is going to? I, I'm, I, I do switch off the lights, 
And I often wonder, why am I this person? You know, maybe it's a hollow gesture. But I have always believed that I can make a difference as an individual. I think it's because I grew up on a farm. And um, I don't know if any of you know anything about farmers. There aren't many around these days. But, you know, nothing happens on farms unless you do it yourself. You know, when the cattle get out in the middle of the night, nobody comes to put them in unless you do it yourself. So you grow up as a child believing that you have to fix things. And, you know, as you've heard for, from Simon, I, I then left being a farmer, which um, was probably quite a sensible thing to do, and I became a barrister and then a banker. But I was very, very frustrated by the fact that I was pr very, very junior in large organisations, and, you know, I wasn't expected to fix things. I saw things going wrong, um, but, you know, there was no process for me to get involved. Um, my, one of my last um, efforts in my banking career was when I had planned a trip to, um, uh, to, to Scandinavia to do what I thought was a very innovative uh, fact-finding tour for clients who had already asked me to do it, and I was told by my boss uh, that I couldn't do it, and so I hit him. And, um, <laughs> and which, which I, I'm not recommending this, by the way, as a strategy, but I hit him out of sheer frustration. By the way, I've not hit somebody since, and I haven't hit anybody before, uh, probably I did hit one somebody once when I was five, but I hadn't hit anybody much. And, uh, and I hit this guy, and, and I'm appalled by it, and, and amazingly, I didn't lose my job. I also made the mistake of, I was a, an investment banker, I hit him in the middle of a trading floor. So it was not a discreet um, activity. And, uh, of course, there was a huge cheer from the traders who felt that... Uh, <laughs> But I, I did it out of sheer frustration because I knew that I was doing something that was right for the business, but because the, 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 it hadn't been endorsed by all these layers of bureaucracy, um, I, I, I was prevented from doing it. So I, as a consequence of this, I realised I was unemployable. I needed somewhere where I could go and just get on with it. And so I was lucky enough to get involved with a new Covent Garden suit company after leaving business school. Um, New Covent Garden Soup Company was a business based on not accepting no for an answer. We, we came up with a new patented technology, which is very unusual in the food industry, um, which was devised when the boffin said to us, you could either make fresh homemade soup or you could give soup a decent shelf life, but you couldn't do both. Well, we did do both. It was based on a constant stream of new products. And when the supermarket said that we had to give them three months' notice of new products, we devised something called Soup of the Month, which is now not very radical, but at the time, which was a single product, but we just changed what went into it. But it was a, you know, it had the same barcode on it, and that how, somehow got around the system. And we were able to de deliver what our customers wanted, which was, you know, a fresh soup every day or every week or every month. And it was based on a culture where everybody felt involved. Yes, everybody played in their particular position in the organisation, but everyone felt responsible for coming up with new ideas and selling products. Everybody, even the accounts team, had to go out on the stands and sell soup to customers um, because otherwise they didn't know what the business was involved. Everybody was encouraged to have new ideas. One of the best suits we ever sold was, was devised, wasn't devised, it was produced by our um, bought ledger clerk. Nina, who'd been bringing it in every day, and one day she was asked to come up with a recipe, and it turned out to be her grand grandmother's recipe. We produced the best-selling soup book. Four million copies were sold, and, and many of the soups in it were from employees, but not from a new product development team. They came from all over the company, and everybody believed. It was a very, democrat it's a very democratic food soup. 99% of the world eats soup, and it was a very democratic within our business. So when we found Green and Blacks, we built on all of the above. Um, and, but, but added to it. So it was a business that then that uh, we, we, it was based on a belief that you could persuade the British to enjoy dark chocolate, something that up until then we had uh, uh, certainly eschewed, with the possible exception of, 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 of Bourneville. So a radical idea. And it was also based on a belief, a marketing belief, that you could turn a simple bar of chocolate into an item of luxury that, that could even be taken to a dinner party as, as a gift. It was, a, it was based on a belief that new products and ideas should be turned into finished products in just a few weeks. Um, I, I, I often see people who are developing new products in consumer goods companies, and they show you a Christmas product, and you say, that's fantastic, I'm really looking forward to it. And they say, don't, don't hold your breath, this is for Christmas 2012 or whatever. It takes that long to get through the layers of bureaucracy. And, uh, you know, that's, by then, it's, it's, it's not a fresh idea. 
And it was, New Green and Blacks was based on a belief that a few people in the UK selling chocolate can really change the lives of others by their actions. We launched the first ever fair trade product in the UK and we helped build a sustainably profitable cocoa industry in the impoverished south of Belize in Toledo. Um, which really, really has made a difference. It's, it's um, a trip that sort of changed my life going out and actually having spoken about it for years, actually realising that you really can make a difference to your supply chain. Uh, especially if, you know, you get involved yourself and you just don't buy into some uh, clever brand like Fair Trade, but you actually know the people who you're working with. And this brought us enormous benefits. I mean, not only one of the first benefits was it became a really cool place to work. Green and Blacks was the place to work, so recruitment became that much easier. But everybody wanted to talk to us. Everybody wanted to talk about us. So a business that had no marketing resource at all, suddenly we had a PR campaign where we, you know, it was, it was Blair's Britain, and we were somehow the, the third way, the, the acceptable face of capitalism. And on every media opportunity, I was interviewed, or somebody else in the organization was interviewed about, you know, whether capitalism had to be so, so, so gruesome. I mean, a lot of it was a load of rubbish, but it gave us fantastic media time. And, um, you know, the brand was built up. It became a third dimensional, a three dimensional brand because it wasn't just about making chocolate, it was about changing people's lives. And the reason it was about changing people's lives is we really believed in it, everybody in the organisation believed in it, and everybody engaged in this debate. It wasn't just me, the CEO, talking about it, it was everybody at every level of the organisation talking about how you can make a difference. We sold the business five years ago. And everybody predicted a quality collapse when Cadbury's bought the business. But in fact, they have been utterly devoted to the brand's quality and its ethics. Um, what has been much more difficult is maintaining the entrepreneurial quality of the business, the entrepreneurial attitude that I've described. And it, it's, been, it's been a real challenge. And I think why it's been very difficult is that... Um, it, it is, is that you know, we have lost the ownership in the business. Everybody at Green and Blacks believed that they were owners in the business. Most of them were, in fact, owners with, with, with shares in it. But by taking away that ownership, that responsibility, it, it, it produced a massive shock. And I think it could easily have been replaced, but it was not, that wasn't prepared for. And so Green and Blacks is still thriving. Its products are fantastic still. It's still changing people's lives. But... Um, as I observe it now, it's perhaps become rather middle-aged and rather corpulent and not as fleet as, as, as foot as it was five years ago. And so, um, you know, there is, there, there is a challenge. So, I, my final point is, I said I was, going to challenge, I was going to challenge you. What are you doing in your own organisations about this? Are you trying to, you know, fix the problems? Have you identified problems, but are you turning your backs on them? I recently met the head of innovation um, of a large consumer goods organisation and uh, I was interviewing her for a job and uh, it, wasn't, it was quite boring actually and I, um, I, I was rather intrigued. I said, so tell me in your, in your current job, if you have a really, really good idea, how do you get it to work within that organisation? How do you take that, that idea through the organisation? And she said, oh, if I had a really, really good idea, I'd take it and run and leave, do it outside that organisation, I'd leave. <laughs> I thought this was, um, this was a, sort of tra a tragic uh, admission of defeat, but I wonder how many of you feel that about your organisation. Do you feel that there are things you can do? Do you, are there, do you have great ideas? And do you think, think you can develop them within the organisation? Or if you had a really good idea, are you like that person? Would you run and do it outside? If you're like that, then I say that you know, there's something wrong with you because it's your responsibility to fix it within that organi your organisation. So thank you very much and I look forward to questions.